Reading, writing, arithmetic, that's usually what summarizes modern expectations of education, but in the good old days, and I don't mean like in the good old U.S. of A. in the 60s or the 30s or whatever your golden era might have been, I don't know who would say it was in the 30s, but I threw it out there, there was also another R in that list, and one that they really wanted to emphasize as far as what would properly equip people to be truly educated. And studying the Bible is an education of itself, but it needs to use these sort of methods of thinking that we also want to equip you. What is that called? It's called rhetoric. Um, So actually, there there were two forms that are left out of modern-day education, dialectic and rhetoric. Um, I'll define those terms in a second real quick, but I'll give you guys three reasons as to why me and Sean are doing this right now and why it is actually very important and scriptural. this, uh, This kind of training is present in the Bible. Solomon does a lot of this kind of training in the book of Proverbs. The apostles, there's a reason why we have long-form dialogues in their sermons in the book of Acts, as well as the First Church Council in the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 15, right? This kind of training is actually really, really integral to your faith and to your own personal just life, and that's why it was a part of every rubric of education up until about... 1900s, which is a big bummer. And there are some conspiratorial reasons as to why it dropped out of the education. Uh, I'm not going to get into them right now, but we'll talk a little bit about what it's done to us as a society that it's been left out of the rubric. And by the way, to my knowledge, it's been left out of every rubric across the world. Those of you guys in other countries can let me know if you still learn about dialectic and rhetoric within your school education. But for those of us in the West, it's definitely left out of our educational rubric for sure. So I'll give you three reasons. First one is evangelism. Uh, The second one is indoctrination or resisting indoctrination. And the third one would be interpersonal conflict. So what is rhetoric? What is dialectic? Rhetoric, and this is from Aristotle, who was one of the first people to kind of reclaim the word. The rhetoricians of his day were kind of hucksters. He was able to create a formal form of rhetoric and describe it in a really impressive way. And he is kind of the person that made it very, very popular and widely widespread taught throughout all the educational systems in ancient Greece and throughout the world. This is how Aristotle defined rhetoric. It is the art and the faculty of observing in any given case the available means of persuasion. And because of this, it is a function that no other art contains. So what he's saying is, is that rhetoric is essentially the art of being able to persuade somebody else. Rhetoric is the formal version. This is the art of persuading someone through a speech or a platform. So not a dialogue, but a monologue. So me and Sean are engaging more or less in rhetoric right now. We are explaining things to you guys in a way where you cannot directly interact with us. You can in a way by like putting things in the comment section and things like that, but it's not as direct as you talking to me. That would be dialectic. So dialectic is me persuading you in a conversation where you have equal say as me. So I say something, you say something, and there is an art form in that as well. Now, if you don't know how to do that, and again, let me repeat the three things I said, evangelism, avoiding indoctrination, and interpersonal conflict. It's really difficult for you to evangelize if you don't know how to persuade. This is once again from Aristotle. It is not enough to know what to say. We must also say it in the right way. So if you have all the knowledge, right, all the capacity to understand the Bible and the scriptures, but you're saying it in a way that people can't understand or comprehend, it doesn't really matter. This is Paul's argumentation against the Corinthians when they were abusing the gift of tongues, where he's like, it doesn't really matter if you're praising God in your own mind. If nobody understands what you're saying, it's not edifying to the body. It also is something that you see Jesus encouraging his disciples with. Let your words be grace seasoned with salt. He doesn't just say, hey, just say the right thing. Just speak the truth. There is a way and means in which you could speak the truth that people can most readily receive. This is also what Paul means when he says, to the Jew I become a Jew, to the Greek I become a Greek, to those under the law is the one under the law, is those without the law is one without the law, that I might win the more for Christ. What does he mean? Does he mean if I'm hanging out with a Gentile, I start eating pork and talking the Gentile slang? No, he's saying that there is a means of persuasion that only Gentiles will resonate with. There's a means of persuasion that only Jews will resonate with. 
There's a means of persuasion that slaves will resonate with. There's a means of persuasion that free people will resonate with. And he altered the way that he spoke to most readily reach the people he was communicating with. And we see him actively do this in Acts chapter 17. We see him use both. In the beginning of Acts 17, you see him using dialectic, where he is reasoning with the philosophers on the Areopagus. So he is talking to them in an, a dialogue format. And then you see him using rhetoric at the end of the chapter when he actually gives a long form presentation of the gospel. And some receive it and some don't. And once again, there's an art form to it. There's a way that he presents it. There's a way that he communicates it that's very, very amazing. Now, again, Dorothy Sayers, so that's evangelism, right? <laughs> Just in case you didn't catch that. So that's evangelism. How can you share your faith if you know the truth, but you don't know how to adequately share the truth? And if you've ever felt like if this has ever prevented you from sharing your faith, where you're like, I don't really know what to say or how to say it, if that's ever entered into your mind, perhaps it's because you don't know about rhetoric. Perhaps you never learned this in school because I didn't and Sean did it. Uh, I think me and him mostly got the school of hard knocks. It's only been in the last couple of years uh, that I've actually studied this in a formal way, actually reading the writings of Aristotle and going through their works. But at any rate, uh, some of you who have never really gone through this, you've never actually challenged your faith in real and meaningful ways, one of the reasons why you might avoid it is because of fear, is because of a worry of being contradicted or conquered within an argumentation and things like that. So you want to say? Uh, just briefly noting, an uh, easier way to understand this is basically the kind of education that every child hopefully has had is through their parents when they are asked, where are your manners? Or is that how you talk to people? Mm -hmm. What's being challenged or encouraged is your rhetoric, your mm -hmm. ability to communicate. Right. So it's not necessarily speaking or debate, it's manners. That's a way to understand this. Right. It's a way to communicate in a way that is not only conducive to ethics, and he makes this claim, by the way, within the book Rhetoric, where he said a sophist, I don't have time to get into that right now. Yeah, that's a, <laughs> <laughs> a sophist is someone who uses rhetoric for basically ill-gotten gain, right? Someone who's going to use it to delude you, to take advantage of you, something like that. Uh, he says a true rhetorician is the person who wants to persuade, but they want to persuade in a way that's going to actually help you discover truth, right? Um, another example, by the way, this, is, this does bear talking about. Uh, in Plato's, uh, the allegory of the cave. Uh, so this comes from Plato's Republic. Plato writes about the allegory of the cave. Again, I don't have time to get too detailed into what he meant, but it's basically a metaphor that he uses for education. And he talks about, imagine that everybody is basically, you start out being like an individual who is chained, staring at a wall, and behind them is a fire, and behind them, uh, behind the fire, are people casting shadows, using the flame as a light source. And then behind them is actually the outside world. And he says, People, when they're talking to kids, essentially the way that they are communicating with them, the way they're educating them, is like people casting shadows using flame. They're not showing them the actual thing. So if I cast a shadow that looks like a dog, a child has an idea of what a dog looks like, but they haven't seen a real dog, right? They're not prepared for the actual experience of holding a dog. They just have a general idea of what it's like. Now, if I stop there, though, as an educator, if I'm like, ah, it's just enough for you to know my version of reality. It's enough for you to just know what I think these shapes are like. You don't actually have to leave the cave. You don't actually have to go outside. That's what we call indoctrination. The real educator is someone who excites the child to want to leave the cave and see a dog for themselves. I hope that metaphor makes sense, which leads to the next point. If you don't know rhetoric or dialectic, you are going to be fodder for indoctrination. So this is Dorothy Sayers. She gave a speech called The Lost Tools of Learning, in which she argues for a classical education and a reinstitution of dialectic and rhetoric within the educational system. By the way, those of you guys who don't know, Dorothy Sayers was a fiction writer. She wrote mystery novels, was a close personal friend with C.S. Lewis, and to my knowledge, the first woman to graduate from Oxford. So a pretty awesome lady, very smart, and a Christian. So Dorothy Sayers says this, has it ever struck you as odd or unfortunate that today, when the proportion of literacy throughout Western Europe is higher than it's ever been, people should have become susceptible to the influence of advertisement and mass propaganda to an extent hitherto unheard of and unimagined? 
do you put this down to mere mechanical fact that the press and radio and so on do uh, have made propaganda much easier to distribute over a wide area? Or do you sometimes have an uneasy suspicion that the product of modern educational methods is less good than he or she might be at disentangling fact from opinion and the proven from the plausible? Very good quote. Essentially what she's saying is because people can read. At her time, the visual medias weren't around. They didn't have news media. Like They kind of did, but not really. I mean, you had like one channel, PBS, and that was about it. Um, but primarily the way that the news was able to interact with people was through newspapers. And she's saying, it's great. More people can read today than ever before. Awesome. But you know what else that means? That means they're reading things in the newspaper. And if they don't know how to think through the arguments being made and say, this is a good argument or this is a bad argument, they are fodder for indoctrination. They are people that will be taken advantage of very, very easily. If you don't know about the laws of logic, if you don't know what's being said, I don't know how many of you guys have tried to listen to a debate, whether it's political or an actual atheist versus Christian debate or something like that, and you're like, I don't know who won, that's probably because you don't know much about the laws of rhetoric. If you're listening to it and you don't know who won, that's because you're mainly listening to confidence. And oftentimes people project confidence who are very good rhetoricians, right? So people who are very good at public speaking, they project confidence. And even if they are losing the debate, if you were just going off of their stamina, if you're just going off of their energy, you'd be like, oh man, they answered that so easily. Well, yeah, they answered it, but was it a good answer? And do you have the ability to parse it out and say, was that, did it actually answer the question? Did it actually address it in an adequate way? Is that sufficient enough to prove a point or not? Uh, this is something that's very important because, again, if you're just going off of emotion, then you might be swayed. And this gets into the parts of rhetoric. So rhetoric is divided into three parts. It is pathos, which refers to emotional reasoning. Ethos, which refers to character, right? So you should believe me because I am this kind of person. What I'm saying is plausible, incredible, and you could believe that because I'm this kind of person. And logos, which is actually the main point of rhetoric. So the ethos and the pathos, the emotion and the ethics of the individual is just to get you to the logical reasoning. However, most people today, most politicians, both Republican and Democrat, they're such good rhetoricians, I would call them sophists, they're such good rhetoricians that they never actually get to the logos. They never actually get to the logical argument behind their worldview. All they do is emotionally move, manipulate, and prop themselves up as authority. They don't actually get to a logical debate. If you've ever heard someone say, let me give you an example of this, if you ever heard someone say, well, the science says, that's an appeal to authority, and again, you should know, that is not an adequate logical uh, argumentation for truth. That's just an appeal to authority. That's just meant to make you feel stupid if you don't agree with what they're saying. It's not an actual argument. So very, very good to uh, ensure that you're not fodder for indoctrination. In Dorothy Sayers' day, this was important. In our day, it's way more important. <laughs> the amount of propaganda out there has never been higher. The amount of manipulators out there has never been higher, and the access to it has never been uh, viable for someone who is younger. Every kid with a smartphone, every kid with an internet connection is open to all sorts of manipulative people who want to take advantage of their innocence and their, la and their naivety. So if you don't know how to talk to them about these things, about how to show them what is a logical argument, why is it a logical argument to think through these things, they will be fodder for that kind of uh, personal indoctrination. Uh, the third one that I said is interpersonal conflict. So I'm a, I'm a marriage counselor primarily. And the number one issue that I see from people who come to me for marriage counseling is communication issues. They don't know how to get their point across to their partner. And they deal with it in a couple ways. They either yell over one another, in which case they never get to the point, or they become passive. They're like, ah, oh, you know, argument doesn't really lead to anything. No one's ever right. I'm just going to kind of do whatever my partner says and envelop a bunch of bitterness and resentment towards them. And that's how we're going to live our lives. So that's usually what I see in marriage couples. They have a lot of unspoken tension within the marriage and they get by by just sweeping everything under the rug and never addressing it. That's a huge, huge issue. That's at a very small level. Some of you guys maybe even had parents that 
talk to you that way. They just kind of yelled at you or something, but they never engaged you in the dialectic, like talked you through something before. But even at a more macro level as a church, uh, this is something that we have to understand. A lot of churches have splits, right? Doctrinal splits that happen because people don't know how to talk to one another. Uh, you had a threatening of that, like I said, in the book of Acts. In Acts chapter 15, there was almost a time where the early church split. And the reason why they were able to remain together was because they had a long-form dialectic debate, right? So these apostles came together, and they were able to give their perspectives biblically. And you know what? The people who made the best argument won, right? The people who had the most biblical argumentation and sound theological reasoning, they're the ones that won, and we have that recorded for us. Now, to be fair, the Apostle Paul says, it didn't really matter to me who won that debate. I already knew it was true, right? <laughs> He's and like, that's what's yeah, key. That's what's key. So I'm not saying that rhetoric, uh, rhetoric creates truth. I'm saying that rhetoric gives, a, uh, gives people the ability to discover it for themselves. So when rhetoric is properly being used, it helps people to discover truth for itself. And that's what me and Sean and Scott on this show are always trying to do. We're not trying to just educate you. We're not just trying to say, like, this is true, just believe us because appeal to authority. We are trying to argue the point across, not so that you th know it because we say it, but you know it because you know that it's true. We have shown you or revealed to you that it's true and believable because of verifiable reasoning. That's what rhetoric is aimed at doing. Anything you'd like to add to that? No, and just noting the conclusion, this is obviously an introduction. In the coming weeks, every Thursday or Friday, for those of you listening on Reach Radio, we'll dedicate some time at the start of the broadcast to just go over a very brief and basic topic. And as well, we'll be providing clips of this uh, not only on our YouTube page, A Reason for Hope, but also hopefully on our own website should that platform go down. But the point being made is this. When we're talking about rhetoric, we're not telling you how to to win, we're knowing how to recognize truth, mm -hmm. not j what to say to people, but how to talk to people. And understanding the difference is going to be key, not just in how we talk to others about our faith, but understand it for ourselves. Test yourself to see you're in the faith. We are asking, well, how do I know if I'm still saved? How do I know if I've lost my salvation? How do I know if I'm still saved? How do I know these things? Well, with a working understanding of the Bible and a proper use of rhetoric, we don't use Plato and Aristotle and Socrates in order to establish those things, they simply recognize what we call truth or the nature of God. How to find it, yeah. And that's what we're trying to instruct you in. So if you have questions in that regard as well, more than welcome on the broadcast. Just make sure the end of the question leads us to the Bible, and we'll be happy to address it. But if you can join us on Thursdays as early as possible, that will be what we'll be talking about. Hopefully it's a source of edification, and it's uh, definitely a blessing for him and I, because it forces us or, I guess, uh, sets aside time for us to get back into this, because we benefit from it too.